Hey everybody, welcome to the last chapter of Mockingbird, chapter 31. Quick recap, in chapter 30, uh, Mr. Tate and Atticus have quite the argument over who is responsible for the death of Bob Ewell. Um, Atticus says Jem, and he wants to make sure that he does it right and he doesn't have anything hushed up. And uh, Hectate says that he fell on his knife, neither of which are true, we learn uh, that uh, Boo Radley was the one who came in with the kitchen knife and stabbed Bob Ewell. Bob Ewell had the switchblade knife. Um, they connect that to the idea of a mockingbird and how it's wrong to hurt anything that only does good. And so telling the world that Boo Radley did it um, would be like killing a mockingbird because Boo only does good and the attention, even positive attention that would come from that, would he would not like. Chapter 31, last one. There's some discussion afterwards, so don't get out of here after I'm done, because there's some more stuff to talk about. When Boo Radley shuffled his feet, light from the living room windows glistened on his forehead. Every move he made was uncertain, as if he were not sure his hands and feet could make proper contact with the things he touched. He coughed his dreadful railing cough and was so shaken he had to sit down again. His hand searched for his hip pocket, and he pulled out a handkerchief. He coughed into it, then wiped his forehead. Having been so accustomed to his absence, I found it incredible that he had been sitting beside me all this time present. He had not made a sound. Once more, he got to his feet. He turned to me and nodded toward the front door. You'd like to say goodnight to Jem, wouldn't you, Mr. Arthur? Come right in. I led him down the hall. Anne Alexander was sitting by Jem's bed. Come in, Arthur, she said. He's still asleep. Dr. Reynolds gave him a heavy sedative. Jean Louise, is your father in the living room? Yes, ma'am, I think so. I'll just go speak to him a minute. Dr. Reynolds left some. Her voice trailed away. Boo had drifted to a corner of the room where he stood with his chin up, peering from a distance at Jem. I took him by the hand, a hand surprisingly warm for its whiteness. I tugged him a little and he allowed me to lead him to Jem's bed. Dr. Reynolds had made a tent-like arrangement over Jem's arm to keep the cover off, I guess, and Boo leaned forward and looked over it. An expression of timid curiosity was on his face, as though he had never seen a boy before. His mouth was slightly open, and he looked at Jem from head to foot. Boo's hand came up, but he let it drop to his side. You can pet him, Mr. Arthur. He's asleep. You couldn't if he was awake, though. He wouldn't let you, I found myself explaining. Go ahead. Boo's hand hovered over Jem's head. Go on, sir. He's asleep. His hand came down lightly on Jem's hair. I was beginning to learn his body English. His hand was tightened on mine and he indicated that he wanted to leave. I led him from the front I led him from the front I led him to the front porch where his uneasy steps halted. He was still holding my hand and he gave no sign of letting me go. Will you take me home? He almost whispered it in the voice of a child afraid of the dark. I put my foot on the top step and stopped. I would lead him through our house, but I would never lead him home. Mr. Arthur, bend your arm down here like that. That's right, sir. I slipped my hand into the crook of his arm. He had to stoop a little to accommodate me, but if Miss Stephanie Crawford was watching from her upstairs window, she would see Arthur Radley escorting me down the sidewalk as any gentleman would do. This part is really important. We came to the streetlight on the corner and I wondered how many times Dill had stood there hugging the fat pole, watching, waiting, hoping. I wondered how many times Jem and I had made this journey, but I entered the Radley front gate for the second time in my life. Boo and I walked up the steps to the porch. His fingers found the front doorknob. He gently released my hand, opened the door, went inside, and shut the door behind him. I never saw him again. Neighbors bring food with death and flowers with sickness and little things in between. Boo was our neighbor. He gave us two soap dolls, a broken watch and chain, a pair of good luck pennies, and our lives. But neighbors give in return. We never put back into the tree what we took out of it. We had given him nothing and it made me sad. I turned to go home. Streetlights winked down the street all the way to town. I had never seen our neighborhood from this angle. There was Miss Monty's, Miss Stephanie's. There was our house. I could see the porch swing. Miss Rachel's house was beyond us, plainly visible. I could even see Mrs. DeBose's. I looked behind me. To the left of the brown door was a long shuttered window. 
I walked to it, stood in front of it, and turned around. In daylight, I thought you could see to the post office corner. Daylight. In my mind, the night faded. It was daytime, and the neighborhood was busy. Miss Stephanie Crawford crossed the street to tell the latest to Miss Rachel. Miss Maudie bent over her azaleas. It was summertime, and two children scampered down the sidewalk toward a man approaching in the distance. The man waved, and the children raced each other to him. It was still summertime, and the children came closer. A boy trudged down the sidewalk, dragging a fishing pole behind him. A man stood waiting with his hands on his hips. Summertime, and his children played in the front yard with their friend, enacting a strange little drama of their own invention. It was fall, and his children fought on the sidewalk in front of Mrs. DeBose's. The boy helped his sister to her feet, and they made their way home. Fall, and his children trotted to and fro around the corner, the day's woes and triumphs on their faces. They stopped at an oak tree, delighted, puzzled, apprehensive. Winter, and his children shivered at the front gate, silhouetted against a blazing house. Winter, and a man walked into the street, dropped his glasses, and shot a dog. Summer, and he watched his children's heart break. Autumn again, and Boo's children needed him. Atticus was right. One time he said, you never really know a man until you stand in his shoes and walk around in them. Just standing on the Radley porch was enough. The streetlights were fuzzy from the fine rain that was falling. As I made my way home, I felt very old, but when I looked at the tip of my nose, I could see fine misty beads. But looking cross-eyed made me dizzy, so I quit. As I made my way home, I thought, what a thing to tell Jem tomorrow. He'll be so, he'd be so mad he missed it, he wouldn't speak to me for days. As I made my way home, I thought Jem and I would get grown, but there wasn't much else left for us to learn, except possibly algebra. I ran up the steps and into the house, and Alexander had gone to bed and Atticus's room was dark. I would see if Jem might be reviving. Atticus was in Jem's room, sitting by his bed. He was reading a book. Is Jem awake? Sleeping peacefully. He won't be awake until morning. Oh, are you sitting up with him? Just for an hour or so. Go to bed, Scout. You've had a long day. Well, I think I'll stay with you for a while. Suit yourself, said Atticus. It must have been after midnight, and I was puzzled by his amiable acquiescence. He was shrewder than I, however. The moment I sat down, I began to feel sleepy. What you reading? I asked. Atticus turned the book over. Something of gems. It's called The Grey Ghost. I was suddenly awake. Why did you get that one? Honey, I don't know. I just picked it up. One of the few things I haven't read, he said pointedly. Read it out loud, please. Read it out loud, please, Atticus. It's real scary, said Scout. No, he said, you've had enough scaring for a while. This is too. Atticus? I wasn't scared. He raised his eyebrows and I protested. Leastways, not until I started telling Mr. Tate about it. Jem wasn't scared. I asked him and he said he wasn't. Besides, nothing's real scary except in books. Atticus opened his mouth to say something but shut it again. He took his thumb from the middle of the book and turned back to the first page. I moved over and leaned my head against his knee. Hmm, he said, The Grey Ghost by Secretary Hawkins, Chapter One. I willed myself to stay awake, but the rain was so soft, and the room was so warm, and his voice was so deep, and his knee was so snug, that I slept. Seconds later, it seemed, his shoe was gently nudging my ribs. He lifted me to my feet and walked me to my room. I heard every word you said, I muttered. I wasn't asleep at all. It's about a ship and three-fingered Fred and Stoner's boy. He unhooked my overalls, leaned me against them, and pulled them off. He held me up with one hand and reached for my pajamas with another. With the other. Yeah, and they all thought it was Stoner's boy messing up their clubhouses and throwing ink all over it, and... He guided me to the bed and sat me down. He lifted my legs and put me under the covers. And they chased him, and they could never catch him because they didn't know what he looked like. And Atticus, when they finally saw him, why, he hadn't done any of those things. Atticus, he was real nice. His hands were under my chin, pulling up the covers, tucking it in around me. Most people are, Scout, when you finally see them. He turned out the light and went into Jem's room. He would be there all night, and he would be there when Jem waked up in the morning. This is the Okay, we got to break some stuff down. 
All right. Um, so the only thing that Boo ever says is, will you take me home? In the voice of a child. Um, we are also led to believe some things about Boo. Um, in the voice of a child, he's an adult still living with his parents. Um, they kept him away from his parents, or they kept him locked away, kind of restricted in his house for a very long time. There is an argument um, to believe or to be made that uh, maybe Boo had some special needs, some special mental or emotional, intellectual needs. And that's why he is so childlike. And that's why he puts the, um, you know, the toys. He connects with the children more than he connects with anyone else um, with that childlike innocence. Um, I also love in the beginning, uh, in the, one of the beginning chapters when they're describing him, they describe him as a malevolent phantom, as this evil ghost. And then a little bit later, you get, you know, his timid curiosity. Uh, I just, I love that contrast when they really see him. Um, the other part I have to talk to you about is, so Scout walks him home um, as a gentleman. He escorts her. So if anybody's watching, there won't be any rumors about that. Um, but notice when she gets there, um, she stands there. Uh, where does she, so he goes inside, he closes the door. She says she's never sees him again. And then, which is just amazing, right? Um, and then she goes somewhere on the porch. Where does she go? She's to the left of the brown door was a long shuttered window. I walked to it and stood in front of it and turned around. So she walks over to the window intentionally. Author puts this in there. Doesn't just say she turns around. She walks over to the window, turns around. The window where they try, or like one side window where they tried to do the note, but the window where the shutters flicked. Uh, the window where she thought she heard laughing. She goes to where Boo Radley was looking at the neighborhood. That was where, he, that was the view that he saw. So she's physically putting herself in his shoes and she looks at the neighborhood. Then it gets even better. She doesn't just look at the neighborhood. She does the entire book again, but from his perspective, look, Daylight in my mind, uh, the night faded. Miss Stephanie Crawford crossed the street to tell the latest. Miss Maudie bent over her azaleas. It was summertime, and two children scampered down the sidewalk to a man approaching in the distance. Who are the two children? John and Scout. Who is the man approaching in the distance? Atticus. The man waved, and the children raced each other to him. It was still summertime, and the children came closer. A boy trudged down the sidewalk, dragging a fishing pole behind him. Jem. A man stood waiting with his hands on his hips. Atticus, when Jem is in trouble for that. Summertime and his children played in the front with their front yard with their friend enacting a strange little drama of their own invention. That's the Boo Radley game and that's Dill. It was fall, now we're all in seasons. His children fought on the sidewalk in front of Mrs. DeBose's. The boy helped his sister to her feet and they made their way home. That was when Jem destroyed her flowers. Fall and his children trotted to and fro around the corner. The day's woes and triumphs on their faces. They stopped at an oak tree, delighted, puzzled, apprehensive. That's when they're school and they're walking back and forth. And he puts the gifts in the tree and Scout is all. Winter and his children shivered at the front gate, silhouetted against a blazing house. It's the blanket. Winter, a man walked into the street, dropped his glasses and shot a dog. Atticus, right? Boo watching from that window. Summer and he watched his children's heart break. What's that one? That's the trial. Autumn again, and Boo's children needed him. And then we get this line, Atticus was right. One time he said, you never really understand. No man until you stand in his shoes and walk around in it. Standing on the Radley porch was enough. That's that bow at the end of that, like bringing it all full circle together. Um, notice the day that this happens. The children are attacked on what day? Halloween. And on Halloween, the biggest monster of all. Boo Radley is the Superman. He's not a monster and he's the hero on Halloween. Um, well then, uh, Scout, she digs on school again. She says, man, I think we've learned everything we need to know about how to be a good human, except maybe algebra. I guess we have to learn that just because we have to. Um, and then she crawls into bed, or crawls into the chair with Atticus, who's sitting in Jim's room. This is fun. This is the author just playing with us. Um, she picks, or what is Atticus reading? 
He's reading a comic book called The Grey Ghost. There's two things about this. Number one, where have you seen this before? Do you remember? The very first interaction with Boo Radley was a dare. And it was Jem, nope, Dill daring Jem to run up and touch the house. And he says, I'll bet you a comic book. I'll bet you the gray ghost. So we've got the very first interaction with Boo Radley is back to this gray ghost. That's the first one. And then you get the story of the gray ghost. Doesn't that sound like the Boo Radley story? And they chased him. Well, and they all thought in the story, they all thought it was Stoner's boy messing with their clubhouse, doing all the bad deeds in town and throwing ink all over it. And they chased him and they could never catch him. They tried to catch him. They had plans to jump on him when he came out of the house. They chased him and they could never catch him because they didn't know what he looked like. And Atticus, when they finally saw him, why he hadn't done any of those things, Atticus, he was real nice. So you've got that parallel between this book or this comic book of the Grey Ghost and Boo Radley's story. And at the end, they are the same. Uh, and then Atticus teaches us his final lesson and the most important lesson when he says most people are, most people are nice, real nice when you finally see them, when you see them for real, when you see beyond the labels and the rumors and the stereotypes, most people are this good at heart kind of thing. I want to, I want to show you one more thing. Um, flip back to the very first chapter. I want to read the first three paragraphs. I told you the whole entire story is told in the first sentence. The first three paragraphs give you the whole story, but it's really in that first sentence. So listen with a new perspective. Chapter one. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jem's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right. When he stood or walked, the back of his hand was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintain that the Ewell started it all, but Jem, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us, when Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. I said if he wanted to take a broad view of the thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson if General Jackson hadn't run the creeks up the creek, Simon Finch would have never paddled at the Alabama, and where would we be if he hadn't? We were far too old to settle an argument with a fistfight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. The whole story in that first sentence. And then it starts, they argue over, I said it began, or Scout says she, it began with the Ewells. We know who is responsible for all of this. And Jem says, nah, it started with Dill. And then you get then you get the whole story, and this is like when Dill comes. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this book. It is truly my Bible in that everything you need to know about how to live and what kind of a person to be um, is found in here. Not just Atticus and all of in Mrs. DeBose and Dolphus Raymond, in the innocence of Scout, um, in the uh, maturity of Jem, in all of it. Um, what a great story. Uh, go back and listen to the whole thing all over again. Thanks for joining me. And by the way, if you want to talk about this, all you got to do is text me. I will always have a Mockingbird conversation at any time for any reason.